I would like to thank Richard Cresno and the generous sponsors behind the Cresno Distinguished Professorship for financing and sponsoring this event today. The Ambassadors Forum brings to campus prominent and stimulating diplomats and politicians who give public lectures and conduct seminars and workshops for graduate students. <coughs> the UNC community, and in particular our graduate and undergraduate students, thus have the opportunity to engage firsthand with international leaders and obtain insights into the practical application of their study of history, economics, European studies, international relations and uh, political science. I'm very grateful to our Center for European Studies and EU Center of Excellence for all the great help and support rendered to our Ambassadors Forum. John Stevens, the Director, Erica Edwards, the Executive Director, and Phil, our cameraman, deserve a special thank you. Great thanks is also due to Bob Jenkins, the Director of the UNC Center for Slavic, Eurasian, and Eastern European Studies. The videotaped talks and discussions in the framework of our Ambassadors Forum can be watched on our YouTube channel and via the websites of the Department of History and the Center of European Studies. Today, it is a great pleasure and honor to welcome Ambassador Jakob Ashvili to the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. The Ambassador is one of Georgia's most senior diplomats. He is the third dignitary to visit UNC in conjunction with our Ambassadors Forum. As you know, the Republic of Georgia gained its independence from the Soviet Union in 1991, and the ambassador joined the Georgia Ministry of Foreign Affairs in that year, and quickly made it to the top of his chosen profession. Prior to 1991, during the difficult Soviet times, however, Timur Yakubashvili never hesitated to express a certain rebellious spirit with which uh, nature has endowed him. In his younger years, he was arrested several times in the Soviet Union for his bare-knuckle Jewish activism, as he said in a recent interview. And unusually for a future diplomat, he also found himself, I believe, under arrest in both Sweden and France, and not just once, but two twi uh, twice. After the Rose Revolution of 2003-2004, which led to the downfall of President Shevard Nasser and his replacement by President Saakashvili after democratic elections in January 2004, Mr. Yakovashvili joined the government. In January 2008, he was appointed State Minister for Reintegration in uh, the Georgian government. He soon also served as Deputy <coughs> Prime Minister. As you know, in, in August 2008, war broke out between Georgia and Russia about South Ossetia. As Minister for Reintegration, Mr. Jakob Ashvili was the architect of Georgia's engagement strategy for improving relations with the regions of Abkhazia and South Ossetia. And then, in early 2011, his appointment as Ambassador to the United States was announced. Throughout his political and diplomatic career, Mr. Jakob Ashvili has been known for his willingness to speak truth to power and for his blunt spoken candor, as a newspaper recently expressed it. We therefore greatly look forward to a very frank and undiplomatic talk today. <laughs> the ambassador holds a degree in physics from Tbilisi University, and he has also studied in the US and in the UK. He is a co-founder of several well-known think tanks in Georgia, including the Georgian Foundation for Strategic and International Studies. Not least, and this is of course important for research universities such as UNC in Chapel Hill, the ambassador also has uh, authored several publications on national security, conflict management, and international affairs. We are very pleased indeed that the ambassador has joined us today in the context of our ambassador's forum. He has recently conducted a very fruitful seminar with our uh, graduate students earlier this afternoon. The ambassador is accompanied by Thea Kendratsche, the counselor at the Embassy of Georgia in Washington, D.C. And of course, it is a great pleasure to welcome the counselor as well. The ambassador has kindly agreed to give a, a, a brief talk on Georgia's role in world affairs, in which he will outline Georgia's relations with countries such as Russia and the United States. And he will give us an overview of Georgian foreign policy priorities. We will then commence a roundtable discussion, and Dr. Robert Jenkins, the director of our Center for Slavic, Eurasian, and Eastern European Affairs, and uh, myself will question and perhaps interrogate the ambassador a little bit after his remarks. After half an hour or so, we will open it to questions from you, the audience. Please feel encouraged to join in and to ask lots of uh, interesting and highly critical and challenging questions. And subsequently, there actually is a reception at the end of this room. Ladies and gentlemen, I have the tremendous pleasure and great honor to present to you His Excellency the Ambassador of Georgia.
Thank you very much. Thank you for interesting introduction. I've been many things in my life, but uh, stimulating. I, I'll try that job. I don't know how successful. Uh, obviously, I want to start by expressing my gratitude for the wonderful opportunity that was given to me by the faculty members and the leadership of the university. I'm especially grateful to you who came in spite of some conflicting program and higher level speaker that you have at the campus today. So I, my appreciations are doubled and inflated because you chose to come here and not to go there. Um, I'll try to give you a, a brief overview of the Georgian foreign policy and especially uh, origins of the Georgian foreign policy. And I think it's not difficult to dig into Georgian foreign policy priorities because they are obvious for Georgians and easy to explain to foreigners. Uh, we've been part of, we've been around quite a long time. We are a country that has more than 3,000 years of statehood. So we are not a newcomers who you know, got its independence as a result of the collapse of this empire and other empire, which most of the modern states today are a result of that kind of process. Georgia was around quite a long time ago, but I don't want to talk about history. I just want to talk about current situation and the future. And every small country since, I don't know, Thucydides was elaborating relations between the small countries and big countries and how wars start and what the alliances mean. We are still there. I mean, everything that you can do in the Pel Peloponnesian Wars is still there. I mean, you can change the names and you will find the modern situation. And when you think about Georgia, think about any small countries of those periods, of ancient Greece or classical Greece, and relationships between small and big, and alliances between small and big are still there. And you will discover that choice of Georgia to find itself very much part of the Euro or Euro Atlantic community. It's an obvious choice of Georgia if you look in our neighborhood. And for ambassador of Georgia to US, there are some extra questions and challenges. Because of nature of the job. And we like to extrapolate on history and lessons that we learn, or mostly we don't actually learn. We like to talk about it, but never learn anything. Uh, we are forgetting that whenever we are talking about European history, Asian history, we are talking about that history, this history, and trying to project all of that knowledge to our modern international relations, we are forgetting something very fundamental. All of those histories are fantastic in history books, but have nothing to do in the modern reality, because on those times there was no country like the United States of America, which is one of the major, if not the, the major player in international affairs. And you just cannot talk about foreign relations using only history of Europe or only history of Eurasia without very important component of the foreign affairs called the United States. And Second World War would end differently if there would not be this country as well. So for history reasons and for some pedagogical reasons, probably knowing European history is very useful. But when we talk about modern times, we have to understand that this country made an enormous difference. And here comes the ambassadors from small country to United States. That makes that difference. First question that comes to your mind, or should come, why US should care about a country like Georgia? I think that's the first question that any ambassador starts to ask on the day one or day that he or she hears that will be representing this or that country in the United States. Why US should care about your country? Obviously, that was a question for me as well. It's one thing what you want for, for yourself, but why others should share what you want. 
And I think I don't have a complete answer, but at least I'm trying to convince American decision makers on my version of answer. That's my job. Actually, if I would offer you explanation of my job in an encapsulated form, is to convince American decision makers why they should care about us. <laughs> That's what diplomacy should do. And you can evaluate from different points of view. Of course, there are things that you call here real politics. Or it's in vogue now to call it real politics, or you know, some different intonations. <laughs> but you know what I mean. Uh, whatever the real politics or real politics or realistic politics um, uh, talk about is purely interest from one state in case of another state. Without emotions, without values, without anything else. Beauty of American foreign policy, unlike some other countries, is that it cannot be, and it is not purely real political. It has its embedded mission that it's not only about state interest, but US foreign policy cannot be divorced from human rights. U.S. Um, politics cannot be divorced from trade. U.S. foreign policy cannot be divorced from security, and etc., etc. And when we are talking about these ingredients of the U.S. foreign policy, I think that complexity is what matters when we talk about why U.S. should care about Georgia. Let's start from purely economic side of it. Energy. Georgia is a gateway to Central Asia and the Caspian Basin. And when we are talking about energy, we all know that energy means not only one bulb in your house, even it's a super economic bulb, but it means security of supplies, security of um, transportation or diversity of transportation, and security of consumers. Why is consuming the energy? We see that there are many countries in the world, I don't want to go into names, that are willing to use energy as a foreign policy tool. We have a number around us. You have some countries in Latin America. We've seen some others in the Middle East whose main foreign policy tool or one of the main foreign policy tools is energy. So energy diversification, supply diversification, transportation diversification becomes the vital part of the foreign policy. And then when Georgia comes in the equation, because only way to take energy out of Central Asia and the Caucasus, but Russia and Iran, is Georgia. Through Georgia, I mean, it's Armenia, Azerbaijan, Turkmenistan, and other uh, countries, <laughs> but Georgia becomes the bottleneck. And if that bottleneck is open, then you have the free flow of energy. If it's closed, then somebody is manipulating. That's why a lot of countries try to manipulate with Georgia, and country like the United States has an interest to have it open for the sake of diversity. When it goes to security, we are you know, between Northern Caucasus, Middle East, terrorist sandwich, terrorist matters, right? We have gateway to Central Asia, where the terrorism is kind of getting more and more popular because of radical Islam. We are gateway to Afghanistan, and I was mentioning today that one 100% of the jet fuel that is consumed by coalition forces in Afghanistan goes through Georgia. 30% of the land cargo goes through Georgia to Afghanistan. Uh, and I can go to some spooky stuff that probably that's not the place to talk about, about spies and special interests and things like that, that you can imagine that it's all happening there. I'll just mention one case which is more or less public already that 
we arrested in Georgia two Iranians who were trying to buy some sophisticated weaponry uh, through Georgia. We handed them to America, by the way. We arrested 11 Al-Qaeda operatives in, on Georgian territory who fled from Chechnya. Uh, we arrested a number of, we had a number of cases of uh, uh, enriched uranium smuggling through the Georgian territories. We arrested um, contrafact dollars that were produced uh, in place called South Society. And actually, chain started from Virginia. People found these dollars in Virginia, and they changed came to Georgia, and etc. and etc. So you see that in this proliferation of the threats, and uh, it is asymmetric of the threats, these key places like Georgia become important. I'm not only uh, talking about that, but uh, you probably know that Georgia is the largest per capita contributor to military uh, operation in Afghanistan. We have 2,000 Georgian soldiers. It's the largest per capita. When we talk about uh, other areas, like political areas, Georgia today, when I arrived in the U.S., debate about Georgia was around war, Russia, occupation, negative stories. And my first task was to change narrative about Georgia. And uh, in the menu that I was looking for, I had many things to offer. We have a great food, we have a great wine, we have a great nature. I actually managed to persuade my government to bring the Georgian chef in Washington and the big you know, track with Georgian wine that my old neighbors now allow me because of that too. Uh, but uh, what's supposed to be a story of modern Georgia? That was a question again coming why U.S. should care about Georgia. And we found that we have something that is very compelling to American public in general and especially to American decision makers. That's an enormous transformation from the failing state to functioning democracy in just nine years. Where we started as the most corrupted country, one of the most corrupted country, one of the most fragmented country, uh, failing state, and today we are functioning democracy, and by any measurement of any international organizations, Transparency International, the World Bank, IMF, uh, you know, uh, Eurostat and others, we are doing surprisingly well. Not just well, but surprisingly well. We are, uh, we jumped from 157 or something like that, easy to biz do business in the World Bank category to number nine. 150 something and nine. We are safest country in Europe by Eurostat. And you ask the people, you know, how do you feel? You know, can you go out and work anytime you want? Georgians give a response that it's one of the safest countries. We proved that corruption is not about ethnic ethnicity or religion or color or behavior patterns. It's only about governance. We were one of the most corrupted countries. Now we are one of the least corrupted countries in the world. And now corruption is on the level of Finland and uh, Norway. It's very, very, very low. And when um, the surveys uh, of um, Transparency International uh, asked the Georgians if they themselves or anybody from their surrounding family or friends experienced any acts of corruption, only 3% answered positively. Only 3 It's an enormous number. We effectively managed to fight organized crime. Remember that 80% of the criminal bosses of Soviet Union were Georgians? None of them are in Georgia now. And what we are exporting now is art. There is no serious opera house in the world that has no Georgian singer, for example. Again, compare the small nation. We are not Italy, you remember it? You know, in every opera house, that's fantastic. So this transformation, lesson that we learned during this transformation, how we did it, it's a compelling story for many other nations. 
many other nations, not only on our neighborhood, but in, it's uh, many other nations in North uh, Africa, in South America, <coughs> and now Georgian specialists are going out and sharing our experience in these countries. And delegations from Guatemala and Panama are coming to Georgia to learn their, our experiences. Even, I'll tell you more, Russian delegations came to learn from Georgia. Russian president said that, yes, yeah, some countries effectively fought corruption, but they were small countries, referring to Georgia. So that's the story of modern Georgia, that it matters for geopolitical reasons, it matters for security reasons, it matters for trade reasons, and it matters as a political transformation that we all want to see in Arab Springs or in any other country on the globe, to repeat somehow the Georgia that managed to transform itself drastically, and which is uh, a success story of US assistance, obviously. Now, when you have a lot of discussions about if US should continue assisting other countries or not, we prove that it can be done. We prove that it's possible and it's no excuse, there's no excuse of any other form but, you know, government unwilling and you cannot hide beside, behind the religious or cultural or any other reasons why you are still corrupted. And I was mentioning that, that there are many books of the World Bank uh, talking about how to fight corruption and there is only one book, How Corruption Was Fought, effectively in Sefau Jews. Um, I don't want to consume all the time because anyway I'll be speaking more. So I'll stop here and we'll continue in the different forms. Indeed. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much for your very interesting remarks. Uh, and I was glad to learn, like probably everyone in this room was glad to learn that so much progress has been made in Georgia since the Rose Revolution in particular regarding corruption, regarding transparency, and so on. Let me ask you a little bit of a challenging question uh, straight away. And you said you were a very open, undiplomatic person, so we expect really great answers. If everything is so good and so great, so well, why was the current government or the last government thrown out at the recent election? So the uh, Georgian electorate must have been dissatisfied. Why? You know, uh, that's a very good question that probably good answer lies not in Georgia, but in Great Britain. You had uh, Winston Churchill ousted from the government after winning the war. So uh, half of the success is actually departure. And I mean, it sounds like an oxymoron, but actually that is the case. If uh, current government, which was an opposition just a month ago, would not be able to compete and win, then all our efforts in Georgia would be not completed. The transformation is completed when you transfer power as well. Otherwise, it's just constant struggle for power and asking from the population more. And population can get tired. And I think one of the reasons why the ruling party lost was the population got tired of the reforms. And it can happen. And probably they demanded now from the new leadership to take a pause. Not in every direction, but in some direction. Actually, the interesting pattern is that there are a number of projects that previous government um, was very much focused. Uh, there are certain cities, for example, city of Batumi, who is completely rebuilt now. And city of Batumi will have in two years more five-star hotels than city of Moscow. Government, previous one, lost big time in that city. Uh, these are interesting phenomenon that uh, can be studied by different groups of people. But uh, uh, as I mentioned, important is a possibility that these kind of governments can lose elections. And even if you have uh, success stories and everything in your hands, you have to allow that process happen. Second, I think uh, it's the nature of the competition. And in our case, we had um, a current prime minister who is uh, himself quite a rich man, 
whose uh, personal wealth is almost twice of Georgian GDP. And he was very openly saying that in, whenever there will not be money enough in the budget to finance some social areas, I'll put my money. And, you know, better future is always compelling for people. Um, and obviously there are some mistakes that any government uh, cannot avoid. No democratic government is immune from mistakes. And one of the ways to fix mistakes is to lose. To throw out the government and yeah. a new one. Yeah, thank you very much. Bob, do you want to come in? Sure. Um, thank you. That's, a, that's a, a very fine perspective to talk about uh, the transfer of power and, uh, and rotation of elections. Um, some analysts suggest that uh, before the Rose Revolution, the character of Georgian politics was uh, built upon networks of corruption and personal influence. Uh, if I were to ask you uh, what's to say that the transfer of power isn't simply replacing one set of networks and personal influence with another today, what would you tell me uh, about what's actually happened in Georgia in the past eight years that would, uh, would characterize a real difference, say, in civil society or the openness of media or the way government transparency works? Institutions, I think, are the key answer there. Uh, you know, um, every country relies on some networks, and these networks can be different. It can be network of individuals, it can be network of corrupted individuals, it can be family networks, or it can be institutions, network of institutions. So democratic countries have network of institutions, and what matters is uh, not individual in the head of institution, but institution itself. One of the biggest achievements of Georgia was that institutions were more popular than persons who were leading the institutions. You had super popular minister of internal affairs, or super effective, I would say. But ministry of internal affairs enjoyed higher trust than the minister. And even it can be frustrating for the minister, I think that's a great achievement of the nation. And we have to remember where we started. Police had the trust of population before revolution, percent. Now it's 86 percent. Okay? That's how people perceive a state institution. When they had a problem with a criminal, they were going to other criminals to fix it, not to police. And now they trust police that if they have a problem, they're insignificant, even if their cat got lost, lost on some kind of roof, they go to police. Or this they did something in the, all the ladies, I don't know, the remote control they call police. And that's the significant change that happened in Georgia's mind. They started to value institutions more than individuals or individual networks. How it was done, it's a different story, but that's the major factor. Thank you. Um, Georgia's most important external relationship is probably still the one with Russia, you know, its closest neighbors, one of the biggest neighbors around. And there was a 2008 war over South Ossetia. Now Russia said it has annexed uh, South uh, Ossetia. Uh, Georgia claims it still is only occupied territory. But that problem goes back quite a few years. It didn't suddenly arrive in 2008. There's also the Abkhazia problem, another difficult region. Uh, what is the future? How can these problems be overcome? And uh, was that war in 2008 totally unavoidable? Of course the war was avoidable, and uh, it was avoidable if the West would be more engaged than they used to. Because only little Georgia would not be able, by any circumstances, to avoid it, unless we would see our um, independence to Russia. Uh, it's very important to understand the nature of the Georgian and Russian problem. Some people are trying to simplify it to Abkhazia and South Ossetia. It's not the case. Abkhazia and South Ossetia were just simply very practical tools for Russian Federation to control the Georgian state or to manipulate the Georgian state. Um, 
you know, uh, it's a, again, it's an old story. If you remember, and of course you do, um, you know, Italian Renaissance period philosophers, and especially Machiavelli, in one of his book, Not the Prince, he's advising that if you want to control somebody, take a small piece of his property, and he will focus all his efforts to get this small piece of property, and you can manipulate by that. That's exactly what Russians did. They got Abkhazia and South Society as small pieces of Georgia, 20% in total, and they effectively were manipulating the entire country. So Abkhazia and South Society, these are cases of manipulation. These are cases how Russians effectively used uh, separatists and separatism against the Georgian state. They have larger problems. A larger problem is starting by uh, notion of Russian self-identity. The problem we have with Russian Federation is that after losing an empire, Russians are quite frustrating, frustrated by who they are. What is their Russia? Mother Russia, as they call it. Because unlike other empires, British Empire, French Empire, Portuguese Empire, Spanish Empire, who were enlarging not only around themselves but uh, overseas as well, they shrink back to original Spain, original France, original Portugal. And when Russians are losing empire, what is that they're shrinking into? That's the big question. And we were talking before about Ataturk, when Ottoman Empire disappeared, then there was a person called Ataturk and his team who created the modern Turkey. And they said, this is the Turkey. This is a success of the Ottoman Empire. That's what we are now. In Russia, unfortunately, we had no person so far who would say, this is Russia. Because Russian Federation is a very much product of Stalinism and Stalin. Stalin created Russian Federation. And then Khrushchev was cutting uh, you know, uh, borders as, as he pleased. You know, for example, Crimea is a big issue between Russia and uh, uh, Ukraine now. It's a quite artificially sort of cut it away from Russian Federation. So it gives you a, a premises to think that Russian self-identity is very much related to territory that includes Georgia. You can call it Russian imperialism, you can call it Russian identity crisis, as you want. But there's an understanding that, you know, when Russians talk about Russia, probably it's the second country in the world that has no defined borders. First one is Israel. Um, well, you don't have a compromise where your borders start and end, I mean, among your population. That was a one reason. Recent reasons are different. Recent reasons are not about territories. Recent reasons are about the nature of Georgia's success. Look where is the problem. If Georgians, Orthodox Christian countries like Russians, without oil and gas or any significant mineral resources, can be successful in fighting corruption, organized crime, building democracy, and open society and market economy, then what the hell is wrong with Russia? Why the Russians cannot do the same? Because they are Orthodox Christian country with a huge population, huge resources, a lot of money, a lot of smart people, very good universities, very good institutions. What is wrong with Russia? And what is wrong with Russia is Russian government. It's a very simple answer. So for Putin and Putinism, Saakashvili and the modern Georgia is a threat because it's a kind of mirror that when you look at this mirror, you don't like yourself. If countries like Georgia can do it, why Russians cannot do it? And then, obviously, whatever methodology is employed, it's a different story. Russians tried everything again. You know, blockade, visa regime, political intimidation, you know, war, everything, I mean, literally everything. During the war, <coughs> Russians employed six different, I don't know, troops, if you want. Land forces, air forces, navy, um, 
ballistic missiles, cyber warfare, information warfare. Everything was used against us but nuclear bomb and submarines. Submarines will be difficult in Georgia. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, it is, uh, let me just follow up. It is, of course, always easier to tell the other side what to do or what they shouldn't do. But what can the Georgians do to alleviate the situation? I appreciate what you have said and that you, of course, believe the fault largely lies with Russia. But there must be something which can Georgia can bring to the table to help the progress of absolutely. peace along. Uh, absolutely. What Georgians can do is to continue to be successful, democratic, transparent, and members of EU and NATO. And I'll tell you what, there is a success story. And it's called Baltic countries and Eastern Europe. They managed to somehow normalize their relationship with Russian Federation. And there is a methodology. How do you do it? Those countries that I mentioned did it in a very pragmatic way to become more democratic successful economically, and members of EU and NATO. There are other countries who try other methodology, like giving in, trying to accommodate Russia's interests, trying to appease, and did not advance at all. For example, Moldova. So, based on that experience, we believe in Georgia the best way to be friends with Russia is to be democratic, open, members of EU, members of NATO, and then talk to Russians about common interests. And there are common interests. I can tell you that at least three major areas where Georgians and Russians should be cooperating are Sochi Olympics, Northern Caucasus, and the trade routes, North-South trade routes, that, and all these are vitally important, important for different reasons for both countries. Instead of that, we are already going to the end of class. Thank you. Um, just to follow up on your, your comments about the success, uh, successful uh, distancing of the Baltics and Eastern Europe, uh, two differences come to mind. One, of course, is uh, historical timing. Um, both uh, Eastern Europe and the Baltics were able to initiate uh, and uh, largely accomplish their independence uh, during the Yeltsin years uh, and the early Putin years, which is a bit different than the timing for Georgia. But more importantly, I think what you saw in both cases was a very assertive um, Euro-Atlantic position on drawing a line that those countries uh, should be independent. And so I wonder if you see that same kind of support uh, for Georgia uh, in, the, in the Western community. Uh, and. Uh, and where we might go in terms of, uh, of getting that kind of support. When I talk about uh, methodology, obviously there are similarities and there are differences. Uh, um, I think that major methodological tool should be there that EU membership and NATO membership helps you to fix your relations with Russia. There is an old Jewish joke that how the wise Jew speaks to stupid Jew, the solid joke, and uh, the answer is first of all by phone and second from New York. So when, if you want to talk to Russians, you have to talk to them not on a bilateral level, because they are too big and they are too small. And you have to be talking to Russia from larger format than smaller format. That's the basic thing. Now, how do you get into those formats? And then I completely agree with you that uh, not so long ago, Many European countries were asking, is Georgia a euro? This kind of question was never raised on the Baltic case. Second, Balts were occupied in the 40s. Georgia was occupied by Russia 200 years ago. Again, memories matter. And then they were abandoned by the same West right after the 40s. Not by all of them, but still. Uh, then they had some kind of father figure, like Sweden, like uh, Poland, like some others who were trying to promote these countries into the European Union, Finland, uh, and the NATO. Georgia has no father figure so far. It probably has friends, not probably, it has friends um, in Europe, but not as a father figure. 
We don't have a diaspora here. Okay, and Baltic countries have this quite strong and successful diaspora in the US. So these are hurdles that are methodological hurdles for us to overcome and to convince the West uh, that we deserve the message. <coughs> and you will see that in Georgian case, we have much harder tasks to pass and much more questions to answer than any of these newcomers in Europe and NATO have. Now, we can go and complain you are not treating us fairly, or we can sort of try to improve ourselves and put them in a position that, look, we are such a great guys, take us. And uh, you will not be able to say no because it will be embarrassment. That's the case in Georgia. Because, yes, we will work twice as hard than others to be as good as others in a short period of time. And it's doable. I believe it's doable. And I believe every day that we are more democratic and more successful, it will be more difficult to say by you or NATO, no, or nine. So let me follow up on that, because um, there are some uh, commentators who say that uh, one of the reasons behind the 2008 war uh, was that uh, the Russians were preemptively acting uh, because you had gotten positive signals, though perhaps not as much as you wished, at the Bucharest summit of NATO earlier that year. Um, and so this was an, uh, an attempt to, um, to preempt any future movements in that direction. But yet last year, uh, the NATO Georgia Council um, made a very positive statement about Georgia's progress and, uh, and called Georgia an aspiring country, I believe, or something along those lines. Are these statements uh, simply symbolic, or do they represent real progress in uh, Georgia's movement toward an ultimate membership uh, in NATO? Uh, I think that if you can call the Russian former president a commentator, you are absolutely right. That was uh, Medvedev who said that, you know, by war in Georgia, we prevented Georgia's NATO membership. They tried. And then there was an answer of Russell's and the Secretary General that it did not prevent anything. And Georgia, I'm a strong believer, will end up in NATO sooner or later. Now, a lot of progress. Uh, we were told initially that NATO membership is only about performance. Frankly, it's not only that. It's about politics too. Because performance-wise, we are already performing much better than many NATO member countries. But politics-wise, there are some countries who are uneasy with Russia for their own reasons about Georgia's NATO membership. Now, our strategy is to be as good that even those countries that are uneasy will have a difficulty saying uh, Being part of the aspirants was very important because what happened actually that we were going together with Ukraine. But after change of government in Ukraine, new government of Ukraine, you know, declared that, you know, NATO is important, cooperation is important, but it will be largely up to the population, and there is not just such a huge popular support to NATO membership in Ukraine as it is in Georgia. In Ukrainian case, it's 30-something percent, in Georgian case, it's more than 80 percent. And we can discuss why these numbers differ, but nevertheless, that's the reality. So for us, it was important to be in a group of people a group of countries that are surely on their path to NATO. And these aspirant countries that are four, three Balkan countries and Georgia, was an important step underlining that we are in the same category and the others. And uh, if we are talking about the corridor of the waiting uh, uh, countries, we are right next to the entrance. So now we are told that you know NATO door is open for you. If anybody can tell me where that open door is, I would really <laughs> appreciate it. But um, uh, nevertheless, I think this step by step approach is working. It's more and more difficult to say no to Georgia. And last elections were important cornerstone that we overcome uh, because. <coughs> 
we had to have a democracy that would be able to sustain the government changes, democratically changing government. You lose, you go. And that's exactly what happened in Georgia. Yeah, thank you. But do you really think the, the door to na NATO is open as long as the problem with Russia and over South Ossetia hasn't been resolved to some extent? Secondly, what about EU prospects? I mean, you uh, keep saying that both NATO and EU membership would be desirable, uh, and well, it probably would be very desirable from jo uh, Georgia's point of view, but the EU is in such dire economic straits at the moment, politically it's not as clear-cut and as united as one would wish either, and Turkey has been applying and has candidate stages for many, many years, so would it not be highly unfair to let Georgia in without first considering Turkey in a more serious way. Uh, my colleague from Baltic Republic, when we were talking about EU and NATO, he said something fantastic. He said, uh, EU is about good life. NATO is about life. So that distinction works for Georgia as well. Uh, if Georgia can enter NATO without South Society and Abkhazia, absolutely yes. Because you had Germany who was divided that became a member of NATO. And Western Germany became very successful only because it has a NATO umbrella. And I talked, to, I talked a lot to Germans. And when we were designing our strategy, we invited German experts, actually those who were negotiating with the Eastern Germans. And he told me very clearly what was the decisive in the unification of Germany was NATO. NATO membership that allowed the Western Germany to develop politically, economically, and become attractive for the Eastern Germany. France, it was a NATO member when it lost Algeria. So territories are not an impediment for NATO, NATO membership. In one case, you had a divided country becoming NATO member and then unifying. And in the French case, you had a larger territory NATO member and then shrinking it. So same with Georgia. And I think the key there is that Georgia took a commitment not to use force for unification, meaning that we don't want NATO to drag into the confrontation with Russia to regain these territories back by military means. And it's a very important commitment. Very hard commitment, but important commitment. So we can do it. Europe. I think that uh, in Georgian case, you see something very important. For a while, we were talking about the European Union. And then we decided not to talk about it, but to act. You can take a key community and accept it by your parliament tomorrow. Will you become a European member? No. We argue with Europeans a lot, but they know one thing, that when we agree to do something, we deliver. And step by step, our goal is the institutional approximation with the European Union. For example, if we will adopt the European Labour Code today, Georgia will never ever develop. We have a very liberal Labour Code today, because adopting the European version right away will drag us into the Greek situation and will not allow us to develop. So that's why I think this gradual approximation is a right turn. Goal is still there. So for us, in this stage, free and comprehensive trade agreement is essential. Visa liberalization is essential. And these are very concrete steps of approximation with the European Union. So when we talk about European membership, we mean it practically and not only politically. Again, what will be European Union in the years to come? We will see. Will Greece leave the EU? I don't know. Probably. Probably monetary union. But, you know, there are many formulas around. You have a Norway who is not a member, but it's fine. But so far, we believe that full membership is essential. It may take time. It's fine. We are not ready. They are not ready. And both of us will be ready. We will be there then. But when it will happen, hopefully so.
Thank you. It sounds to me like a careful theory of seduction. <laughs> um, in in uh, 2010, Georgia introduced constitutional changes that uh, will begin to shift it from uh, a strong presidential system to uh, a more of a parliamentary system. Um, do you think that those changes uh, in the long run will have an impact uh, on, let's say, broadly governance and more specifically foreign policy? Do you anticipate changes in the role of the foreign ministry as a result of these constitutional changes? I don't think that uh, it will affect the foreign policy. It will drastically affect the internal policy because it will be uh, diffusing power to parliament and local authorities more. Uh, you know, it's like a biblical, you know, there are times to collect stones and to then throw them away. Uh, revolution, I mean, it was, and it's rather unfortunate to quote some revolutionary leaders of Soviet Union, but Lenin said that revolution is viable only if it can defend itself. Uh, when we had the Rose Revolution in Georgia, it was important that it would defend itself, and if you want to conduct any changes or any reforms, you have to consolidate power. That's exactly what happened. This political team consolidated power. But you know that power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. So there is a time to give it away in a civilized manner. Civilized manner means to cede it to parliament and to local authorities. The constitutional changes actually were designed not to make Sarkash really a prime minister, as many people, even pundits around the world were thinking, but to diffuse power from presidential, from one man show to more parliamentary system, and to have some kind of hybrid system where you have a strong president, a strong parliament, and then to local authorities. Because if you would keep this power for a long period of time, it will corrupt you in a different way. So those constitutional changes were aiming at we ended up having a cohabitation of now president being from one party and prime minister of another. We are still learning how it's going to work. It's not an easy process. We see a lot of quarreling between these two men and one switching off electricity rather. But uh, nevertheless, uh, I think it's a normal process of fermentation of democracy. So if the constitutional changes you think will have a little impact on foreign policy, will the political changes, the transfer of government, uh, have any impact? Do you see different priorities in the new government? On declaratory level, not very much. I think that you know, uh, they will be in the same line. Uh, our post leaders, actually, President and Prime Minister, are in Brussels today, meeting EU leadership and NATO leadership. And both of them convincing both of you and NATO that we have a same foreign policy priorities. It's uh, important that it's the first foreign visit of our Prime Minister, which happens in Europe. It's already a good sign by itself. And I think um, that those foreign policy priorities are not only properties of the political leadership. But there is a consensus in the political class that that's the foreign policy priority, which is demanded by realities and the population. And every political leadership will be an executive tool. Now, we have to be careful that in this uh, unexperienced new leadership in politics, some part of them are experienced, some part not really, uh, that they will not make unavoidable mistakes. And I think it's important to pay close attention to that. Uh, but um, drastic changes, I wish Russia would give us uh, room for the drastic changes, but I don't believe that they will. Thank you. Will the, uh, will the Prime Minister and the President have dinner together in Brussels? What do you think? Uh, they will most likely avoid it. <laughs> okay. I would like to open it up to questions from the audience in a minute, but uh, talking about uh, dinner and eating, you said before that you were eating for your country in Washington, D.C., that that was the role of uh, an ambassador these days. I'm sure you were joking, but what is the role of an ambassador today? How do you see your major priorities and how that, has that changed in the last five to ten years? Uh, 
You know that in every job there is a part of the job. Rest is true. <laughs> and then in my case, I'm eating. You like eating? <laughs> I don't. I like eating, but I eat from a country. That's true because part of diplomatic performance is either to host dinners or to go to dinners. And in each case, you cannot uh, offend. Sounds like, sounds like a great job. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> difficult. Um, but I haven't eaten so much Caesar salads in my life like that. <laughs> Uh, the role of the diplomacy, we had a little time to discuss about it. I think that it's completely different than it used to be. When I was trained as a diplomat in Great Britain, they told me that diplomat is a person who can tell you to go to hell in a way that you actually look forward to the trip. <laughs> uh, it's not true anymore. Because there is very little that diplomat can hide. Uh, it's a globalized world. I cannot lie to you, not because I don't want to, or my memory is bad, but you can double check it right now through the internet. Anything that you can say can be checked and double checked. So that's why the role of the diplomat is not anymore to try to say a wonderful lies about his country, but it's about promoting his own country, promoting his country's interests, and fighting for those interests. And it's done in a different way in different countries. America is a very unique country for diplomatic experience because unlike in Europe, in Europe you have a one vertical of power. You have Ministry of Foreign Affairs, you have a President or Prime Minister's Office, they have a foreign relations part, you have Parliament which has some foreign relations part, and that's it. You, know, you have universities which are very nice. In US, in order to achieve something very small, you have to talk to 200 different people, and all of them matter. You have State Department, you have Department of Commerce, you have a Pentagon, you have um, USAID, <coughs> you have Department of Transportation, and these are very, very big departments. You have White House, you have Senate, you have Congress, you have their staffers. You have think tanks, you have universities, you have journalists, you have businesses. Do you want me to continue? <laughs> Governors of different states, and all of them matter. It's a completely different situation than in Europe. So that's why you have so many dinners and receptions, <laughs> because there are many people. And it's challenging, but it's reward it. Because you may get no in the State Department, but you can twist it to yes to other offices. If you will get no in Kedorset, it will be no. In US, you can change it. And, but you have to prove that you are right. It's not only mesmerizing somebody or something like that. You, and it's a challenging job, but it's a rewarding job. Then, I, I'm not writing reports that classical diplomats should be writing. I'm not writing overview of American politics. Because I believe that people back in Georgia can do it without me. They can go on internet, read American newspapers, websites and everything, watch TV, and they can make up their mind what is happening. So I don't need to do all that that diplomats were doing even five years ago. I can send them a link and let them watch it. Because I think it's a waste of time uh, and money if you are asking from your representative, who you represent your country overseas, to do this kind of thing that you can do from home. You don't necessarily need somebody to send there. But you cannot talk to, I mean, nowadays with the uh, internet you can, but you cannot send somebody in university and talk uh, if you don't have a representative. Information that you can gather through the private talks or influence that you can have through the private talks cannot be substituted by uh, you know, 
some uh, telephone calls or messaging. Um, biggest question in Washington is asked is, when you entertain? Nobody cares where your office is. <laughs> Nobody cares where you are sitting and writing your secret telegram. Everybody will be asking you where you entertain, where you have receptions, where you have exhibitions, where you have concerts, where you have interactions. And uh, we found that ambassador's residence in Washington is more important than the embassy building, even in a fantastic location that has no room for entertainment. And I think. There is a huge competition. You have to imagine what I'm talking about. You have 167 embassies in Washington. And you have one State Department, <laughs> one Senate, one Congress, and these 167 are competing for attention. And you have to know that we have an ethics committee in every ministry or every department. And not all of them will be ready to come with you in the restaurant, but they will be ready to come to your house. So you better have space for hosting people, because diplomacy is back to human relations and not about secrets or lying or writing the secretive reports, you know, overviewing the media of the United States. Thank you very much. I think you have won an awful lot of recruits tonight. <laughs> people will be applying. It seems to be all about dining and talking to people. Oh, my wife, actually, I asked recently to my son, who is a student in the US, what do you want to become? He said, you? I said, me? He said, yeah. Only thing you do is talk. <laughs> So that is what we have in common, academics and ambassadors, I guess. Well, I would like to open it uh, to you, the audience. Please uh, come forward with any questions you may have. Um, can I see? I believe that I have a cultural question. Sure. I enjoyed the uh, review of contemporary Georgian fiction that was published by Delphi Archive Press this year. Yeah. Uh, it was nice. It was the first time I'd read a lot of this stuff. And so I was wondering, uh, as an ambassador from a small country, what role the cultural plays in promoting your interests abroad and how it ties into the social and the political? You know, um, I think it's essential. It's essential as a starter. Imagine every relation as a dinner. Okay? If you don't have a good starter, then you are not having a good dinner. And before you go to main course, you have to catch an eye or ear or interest of somebody. And I think that the culture is a good starter. It's a good starting point. Because if you go to somebody directly and say, you know, oil, gas, uh, energy, war, this, that, I'm sure I'm not even that tired to listen to all of that. But you will find the cultural ties, you offer something unique then they will be more inclined to listen to you and to your problems or to your wishes. And I think the Georgian culture in that sense is an uh, unexplored area. I always say that Georgia is like a very good book that you are getting and you haven't read it, but you are in a, a anticipation to read it. You know? And today there are not that many good books left that you can read. Of good movies to watch, don't watch the latest uh, James Bond, that's <laughs> but, but I want to say that um, hmm? Georgia is a very interesting okay. country, not because I'm an ambassador of Georgia, but um, it's a quite unique civilization. That is, because it's small, it was not exposed to the rest of the world. Um, that fiction book that you uh, referred to, uh, I had to talk a bit about this book with our former Minister of Culture four years ago. And I said, look, I have a problem. Because when people are asking me what I can read Georgian, but in English, the only thing I can refer to is a poem of 12th century. You know, what about modern Georgian literature? Where is it? It doesn't exist if it's not translated. So that's why the idea was to translate it and make it affordable for foreigners. So you have to make it affordable. 
if you come to our house, residence, you'll find two distinctive things besides myself, which is very distinctive. Um, Georgian art, I'm an art collector, so I brought my collection of art. Uh, 55 paintings there on the wall. So you can see Georgian contemporary art. We have a Georgian uh, ethnographic corner with dresses, rugs, uh, you know, some distinctly Georgian armor and things like that. With a story, it's a story behind every artifact. These artifacts are not there as a museum exhibits, but they tell you a story. They tell you a story of Georgia, a specific region. And then you have a Georgian food which is very distinctive because of the practical reasons. Because we have in Georgia 9 out of 11 climatic zones in the world. Every climatic zone has a specific vegetation, which is reflected in the nutrition. Add to that uh, the fact that we were in the middle of the Silk Road, which means spices. So different vegetation, spices together, produce the unique food. Then you add up the Georgian wines, and you may know that we are claiming that we invented the wine. <laughs> and you already have a Georgian story. And after that, people are more inclined to listen to your political problems than before that. As I said before, it's a seduction. Um, keep uh, talking about food and wine tonight, I wonder why. There's a question right at the back. Can you speak up loudly, please? Maybe your commerce minister, I don't know. I read a lot of magazines, and I was, it was either The Economist or Bloomberg Business Week. And I started reading about some city or industry in Georgia, and I thought, that's not in Georgia. I was thinking, United States, Georgia. But whoever put that together, it does stop you. It's very interesting sort of business promo for Georgia, your country. Uh, my question, I came in late, and if you answered this question already, just let it go. Um, what are the two main issues in, in the country of Georgia now? As far as political economics, so to speak. Okay. First of all, I'll talk about a little bit about country promotion. There are so many things I don't do in Washington. I don't participate in so many things which I consider useless. Charming Washingtonian public? Why? This is the, one of the most spoiled public you can imagine because you have 167 embassies and every embassy is trying to show off and organize something for Washingtonians. But now, interesting part is who are Washingtonians? There are very few because Washington is 160 something embassies, international organizations, uh, World Bank, IMF, you know, international think tanks, and federal government. So how many is left to who live in Washington, who were born in Washington, who live in Washington? Very few. So reaching out them doesn't make any sense. But diplomats traditionally do this kind of thing. I think it's more value coming here, driving five hours or so, and talking to you than organizing something in Washington that nobody will not resonate at all. In the same sense, uh, small countries have a limited amount of money. So if you want to reach out the world, uh, you can organize some small events somewhere that nobody will notice, but you can consolidate this money and write something in the Economist or in a foreign policy or somewhere. It will resonate to everybody. Okay, and that's using smartly little resources that you have. And it works. Look, in the advertisement business, you can hear the phrases that stick. Not only about companies that if you don't have iPhone, you don't have an iPhone. But it's also in Malaysia, truly Asia. It sounds like funny. Now, of course, Malaysia is Asia. But you remember it, you want to go there. And it's the same with the country branding that when it goes to Georgia, that this kind of high-profile outreach, even if it's expensive, it's very expensive, 
has a influence. Now, issues in Georgia. Georgians have only one issue. It's about government. And now the biggest issue is, because everybody wants to be a president in Georgia, we are also qualified <laughs> that we know everything, especially more than others. Um, but uh, in a more serious note, it's about this very unique situation of transition of government, cohabitation of one president, one leader being president from one party, a prime minister from different party. It's quite unique and it's occupying hearts and minds of almost everybody in Georgia. Who is interested in politics or not very much? They are only politics today. Thank you. Yes, please. <coughs> Yes. Yeah. Hi. First of all, thank you for coming. Really enjoyed your visit. Um, what I know about Georgia is I have several. It's okay. I can scream. Um, I have several friends that are doing the Teach and Learn with Georgia program, mm -hmm. and I was wondering, like, what the like geopolitical strategy behind that was. I think it's really great how the government actually is sponsoring these native English speakers to come in and teach English. And I was wondering if you could talk about that a little. Uh, bit. I'll tell you uh, what is behind it. Then. You know what is the widest spoken language in the world? It's a broken English. Uh, today, if you don't speak English, you are illiterate. And I mean it. And I'll tell you why. Because uh, ninety-nine percent of any literature, scientific or science fiction, is in English. If you want to get knowledge, you have to speak English. You can speak German, you can speak Portuguese, French, it's fine. It's even better, it's more than fine, it's fantastic. But if you don't speak English, you don't have an access to the literature. In any field, Physics, medicine, uh, literature, poetry, movies, doesn't matter. English is a basic tool for communication as well as computing. My kids are better in gadgets than I am, that's for sure. But what we do, there are two things. First is massive introduction of people to English language. They may speak little, but it's already better than nothing. They may know only ABC, but it's better than knowing nothing. And it has a larger implication. It's a touch with the culture. When somebody in a remote Georgian village, you will see a young girl joking at 7 a.m. and all the neighborhood dogs following her, you know, is a barking. That's the difference. It's a cultural shock for some of them. But it's an interaction with a different culture. And remember that we came from homophobic, xenophobic Soviet Union. And people in this megapolis, they are more introduced to foreigners than people in the countryside. Now they are just their own foreigner, which they think that it's, uh, you know, it's not, uh, it's almost deputy of the God. They have their own English speaker. So what we are trying to do is not only to introduce the English language as a professional something, but more to English language culture. So you don't necessarily have to be a qualified teacher, but you just can be an English speaking person. We do the same with computers. Every uh, kid who goes to school gets a network. And most of his classes are in the network. Most of the information he or she is getting online. Because in a competition of ideas and the place in the world, if you don't have these two basic skills, computing and English, you will be part of the third world, fifth world, whatever world you can imagine. And we want to build a new generation that will be more and better equipped than we are now. Thank you. No wonder that everyone thinks they can be president of <laughs> sort of education. <laughs> Any more questions? Uh, yes, this lady. 
Yes. Oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, I research journalism and mass communication. Uh, I'm very interested in how to use the media in your work to help you work. Thank you. Well, it's a different medical world. Medical. Yeah. Medical. Yes. Um, in the medical world yeah. or diplomatic world? In the medical world. Diplomatic world. Yes, how do you use the new media in your job in the diplomatic world? When I first opened the, the Facebook page, my wife was making fun of me. And she's a journalist. I said, you are a minister. You have a, you know, Facebook? I said, yes, exactly, I do have. And if I want to communicate with public, I write in Facebook. I'm still not good at tweeting, <coughs> you have to assume, but I will learn it, I promise. Uh, social media consider to be a shortcut to traditional media. Instead of organizing press conference, I can tweet something or post something, and then immediately it will catch the interest of the mainstream media. So think about social media as a shortcut. And remember that we now live in a period of different connotations. When I say like, it doesn't necessarily mean that I like somebody, but I click the like button. When I say share, it's not me and somebody sitting and sharing something, but it's sharing some website uh, there. And etc. etc. So these communications are part of our life. And obviously they are a big part of the diplomatic life. And in open world, it's obligatory, I think, that every public officer should have this shortcut of publication and communication. And then that's up to public to decide, you know, what they like and what they don't. We are living in a different realities. Because previously ministers had an enigma, you know, they were enigmatic people. When I was a kid in a school I had no idea that teachers go to toilet, for example. You know? uh, there were enigmatic people, and now everybody's life is very much exposed. And it's exposed because you have a photo cameras, you have a telephone, you can be filmed anywhere doing any stupid things, you know, stupid mimics, and it will be the next day on the Facebook. And in that way, I think <coughs> that openness of the uh, public figure's life makes it, first of all, quite difficult, and it's a different choice than it used to be, but also gives you an opportunity of a shortcut to your public or to any audience that you want to of course, and Of course, it can also lead to the fact that you write something, publish something very quickly, which you regret an hour later. If you had a few days to think about it, like a press conference with proper presentation, uh, preparation, you may not have sense. Uh, I will tell you that what it it will lead to that you will have a different, um, different category of the public figures. Mm -hmm. Not the same kind of public figures that we had in the 20th century. 21st century public figures will be different. Better? I don't know, but different. Probably not. Thank you. Can I, yeah, please. Um, a lot of the talk has been about Russia or the West or whatever, but what about Going forward, China's kind of seen more as a rising power. What are potential areas you see of cooperation with China, or maybe potential areas of disagreement? Uh, you are too young to remember that this is the country that was um, horrified by Japan. Oh, Japanese are getting rich, buying everything, Japanese investment, everybody is learning Japanese language, you know, the kimono, bushido, and tea, and all of that. Now it's China. Tomorrow it will be something else. I can tell you from my experience, when I talk to American businessmen, 
not only in Washington, but in Arizona or Arkansas, they tell me China, forget about it, Mexico. Most of the investments now go to Mexico because it's closer, because uh, the working culture is different. In China, most of this uh, cheap labor comes from the countryside, so they are not locals, actually, in a certain sense. In Mexico, you can get locals, they are families, they are more dedicated to your businesses. So if you invest in labor there, it pays off 10 times more than in China. They are not stealing your intellectual property, and things like that. So I think Chinese mythology is going to be on decline. I think that Chinese have a, internally quite significant problem, not only with the human rights and things like that. Uh, we will still have an inertia of China for a decade to come, but what will happen in one decade will change entirely the, the, the world in geopolitics. U.S. will become self-sufficient in energy. It will entirely change the geopolitics of the world. So I think we have to look a little bit in the future. I was talking to students uh, you know, before coming to this talk, and I told them that remember that in 2020, Europe, entire European population, will be 7% of the world population. Okay? And America will be probably another 10. That's it. So there are different things happening in the next 10 years that your generation should handle. And probably that's a good time you have a wonderful place, wonderful professors to think about things that will happen in 10 years. Because the world will be drastically different in 10 years than it was 10 years ago. For 10 years for me, the changes that happened in 10 years, it's nothing to compare what will be from nowadays and 10 years after. Technologically, Politically, demographically, it will be a completely different world. I am not sure if we are ready for it, but we will be dealing with it for sure. Those of us who will be alive. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Any more final questions? Then let me ask you a final question about a topic we haven't really uh, covered tonight. That is the Georgian economy. How is it doing? What are the prospects for improvement? How has the global and uh, uh, financial uh, uh, economic crisis affected Georgia, if at all? And secondly, the former Soviet Union had lots of environmental problems. Is that also the case as far as the former Soviet uh, state was concerned and is concerned? Um. Of course, we are part of the global economy. We are not existing disconnected from the world economy, and we are affected by everything that is happening uh, in the world economy, for sure. But Georgia chose the different path of development. Because we are not cursed or blessed by mineral resources, uh, only thing we can rely on will be our own brains. And forms of government and governments and kind of businesses. <coughs> I can give you several examples. I was working very hard to bring to Georgia uh, production of electric cars. So one can think, Georgia, electric cars? This guy is crazy. <laughs> I'll tell you why it makes, why it makes sense for Georgia. Georgia is a small country, and electric cars nowadays, I don't know about 10 years, I actually know, but in these 10 years, you can drive 200 miles with one charge. That's more than enough in Georgia. Okay, because it's a small country. Second, you have in Georgia something very unique and different than others. We have a lot of hydropower. Meaning electricity is cheap in Georgia. So we can compete for electric cars. It makes sense if you have a cheap electricity, then you have a fuel for your car. 
I'm not talking about environment so far. 23% of our trade deficit is originated by consumption of the fuel that we import. If we switch to electric car and it's domestically produced electricity, then this 23% is eliminated. So I can give you already three reasons why such an exotic idea as production of the electric cars can be economically beneficial for Georgia. Second, you know what was the largest export item of Georgia last year? Automobile. And we don't produce so far any, not electric, not non-electric. Whatever we did was very simple. We simplified the registration procedures. We eliminated corruption. And you can buy a registered car in Georgia in 15 minutes. <laughs> Everybody around Georgia buys cars in Georgia. Armenians, Azerbaijanis, Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, and all of these guys are buying cars in Georgia. And Toyota decided to open the major hub in Georgia, and others decided to open in Georgia. But you know, it's imported in Georgia and then exported. And obviously these are not only new cars, there's the second-hand cars, second-hand cars means the body shops, means the, you know, some notary registrations, translator. 30,000 people are employed around this car sale business. So it became a number one item of export. By what? By paper. You remember that we live in a world where Facebook that produces air is more expensive company than Boeing that produces airplanes. It's a different kind of economy we are talking about today. So for Georgia, we are trying to find our niche where you don't necessarily produce, I don't know, automobiles, but it can become a major export uh, of your economy. Grossman has to say that recently it was a bubble which burst in the modern still, economy. Still, so let's but still, I mean, how much it burst this bubble? I mean, still, Facebook one is one of the most expensive companies that you have. How many, I mean, it has a different problem as well. How many people work in Boeing? And how many people work in Facebook? Okay, how many people work for Google? These are not labor intensive areas of economy. So that's why you have to think about combination of labor intensive and non-labor intensive. Not everybody can be a computer geek, for sure. But everybody should have a skill set for new economies to come. So that's why when we are talking about Georgia, we are thinking, yes, about electric cars. We are thinking about the fact that you can have a a larger export item that you don't actually produce. We can think about, you know, innovative parts of economy and things like that. And you definitely need for that computers and English. Thanks very much. I think we can all agree with that. Thank you very much for your advice. <laughs>